folks, as we get started this morning, we're going to open up with some time to quiet our hearts and our minds and our senses and just bring ourselves before God in worship. Uh, our centering prayer this morning is, God, open our ears to the resonance of your call or come before God in any way that works best for you. Let's take a few moments. Friends, as we've lifted our hearts and our minds, I am going to invite you to lift your voices this morning in any of those stories where you have seen God or heard God or experienced God outside of these walls. Where has your faith surprised you? surprises this morning? Well, we had the joy, as Lance is walking up, we had the joy yesterday <laughs> of uh, watching children in motion in all the various forms. It started with soccer, with kindergarten girls yesterday morning, and then fifth and sixth grade boys, and then two and a half hours of a dance recital that covered everything from the littlest littles to the most graceful graduating seniors in point shoes, and it was absolutely a joy. And there were the cutest little mommy and me, and daddy and me, parent, adult, and me, dancers, and it just, it was just joy. It was just utter joy. You can't see people moving their bodies in ways that make them happy, whether it's kicking a soccer ball or Kicking a pirouette. I didn't dance, I don't know. Um, it was just it was just joy. I don't know. You start and we'll follow with. I had a daughter that did that for a little bit. Um, Monday was the second anniversary of Linda's passing. Mm -hmm. And I spent had lunch with my son. And that was uh, that was good. We both can uh, cry together. And then I was invited to a neighbor's for supper, who was also lost his spouse. And uh, there's, you know what? God appears in fresh asparagus. Amen. <laughs> 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 is looking, Lance also brought the joy and the beauty of rhubarb, or has access to... I've got more. I do too, in my garden. <laughs> so, the joy and beauty of God in all things. Amen to that. Well, friends, I'm going to invite you to rise in body or in spirit this morning. We come before God not as abandoned sinners, but as beloved children, and so with the confidence of the children. God. Let us humbly confess our sin with the prayer that's in our bulletin. Almighty God, you poured out your spirit upon gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and a new community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your spirit among us. We plug our ears. We clamp our mouths shut. We close our eyes refusing to hear or speak or see. 
We do not listen for your word of grace. We do not speak the good news of your love. We do not live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your Spirit, and fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people, doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's take a moment for silent reflection. Jesus Christ, our living Lord, we pray. Amen. Friends, Christ hears our prayers with compassion, wipes away our tears with grace, and forgives our sins with mercy. Rest assured that all is well, and that in Christ we are indeed a people loved and forgiven and free. Alleluia and amen. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another this morning. <laughs>
God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans? Every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the regions of Libya, bordering Cyrene, and, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own language. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see, visit, will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness, and the moon will be changed into blood, before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the gospel of the Lord, and it be a blessing to our hearts. So before we get going this morning, there's a yellow insert in your bulletin. I thought about making it bright orange, and then I decided to save your eyes this morning. You're welcome. Uh, we are going to use this reading as we go through the sermon. We're going to go bit by bit. So we'll do the first bit, and then there'll be a little more. And then we'll do the second bit, and there'll be a little more. So from sound to sound, we'll take some breaks. So, just preparing you. All right, more than just about any other story in Scripture, the story of Pentecost is a story that is meant to be interacted with. Meant to be told and retold, not in a let me read you the words on the page sort of way, but in a let me spin this tale for you with the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts sort of way. It's the kind of story that can't and shouldn't sit still. A story of movement, a story born of the movement of the Holy Spirit, a story that inspired the movement of the early church, and a story that continues to move in and through us today. It's a story with life and breath and speech and sound. So we're going to explore our own faith through the sounds of this ancient story today, with a little help. First wind. Join me with 
with the reading. With rushing wind and holy fire, God who moved over the deep in a holy breath, come to us this day, this Pentecost day. Arrive in the wind. Come, Holy Spirit, come. everything that's been going on with the weather lately, this one feels a little too acute, right? A little too intense. We know just how powerful wind can be. Wind can make or break a moment in a variety of outdoor sporting events. The first soccer game that my boys had this year was at the beginning, or about the middle of April, and it was a super windy Saturday, and there were definitely some goals that ended up flying wide one way or the other because the wind decided to push them, and I'd be willing to bet that Jeff, or Lance, or Kim might have some stories about golf shots flying off in an unintentional direction thanks to the wind, or at least we claim it's because of the wind, right? <laughs> or not. <laughs> But there is also the less trivial, fun side of wind. The terror and the devastation that can be wrought by wind. All of the recent headlines of tornadoes in Missouri, Nebraska, Texas, Iowa, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and more. The derecho winds that hit Iowa in August of 2020. I don't know if any of y'all remember that. 126 to 140 mile an hour winds or the derecho winds that hit the Boundary Waters in July of 1999. They started with 58 mile an hour winds in eastern North Dakota, peaked at about 100 miles an hour around the Boundary Waters, and continued to blow through southern Canada all the way to the east coast of Maine. And then there was the St. Peter tornado of 1998, March 1998. I was 14. That tornado missed my parents' house by a quarter of a mile. There was a news report that Care 11 did last year because last year was the 25th anniversary of that tornado. The report said it's been 25 years, but few in southern Minnesota have forgotten. On March 29, 1998, an intense supercell spawned 14 tornadoes in the St. Peter Comfrey region, killing two and injuring 21 others. In about a four-hour span, the storm caused roughly $300 million in damage, including heavy damage to Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter. I remember growing up thinking that Gustavus was like, I knew it was in St. Peter, but I thought it was like far away. And after the tornado, it was like, oh, no, it's right there. But you couldn't see it because of all the trees. The report said on the same day, that same weather system produced an EF4 tornado that flattened the small town of Comfrey. Three quarters of the buildings were either damaged or destroyed by 200 mile an hour winds, including the school and local churches. Care 11 meteorologist Belinda Jensen says the twister that touched down in Comfrey was on the ground for 56 miles and debris was found more than 130 miles away. I have vivid memories of that time. Wind can be nice. It can be a nice gentle respite, a cooling breeze on a hot day. Wind can be an ally, filling the sails of a ship to get it moving or drying out a wet field so the farmer can get back to work after the rain. Wind can be insistent, hurrying us along as it pushes us, gently or not so gently, from behind or impeding our journey as we try to best a strong headwind. Or wind can be outright ruinous. Our scripture reading this morning said, When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. That Greek word for wind is the same word for breath, is the same word for spirit. And the rest of that phrase makes it clear that the wind-breath spirit that blew through the disciples' place that day was a powerful one. It was a strong breath. It was a violent wind. It was a forceful spirit. It was a wind to catch attention, 
It was a wind to get things moving. It was a wind to burst open the doors and fling wide the shutters to make sure that the whole house and everyone in it was open and ready for the work that God had for them to do. We all know that feeling of being buffeted by the wind, pushed and nudged and taken by surprise. Sometimes it causes us to stumble. Sometimes it causes us to close our eyes or turn our faces away, but we cannot help but be moved by it. So as you listen to the wind this morning, think about how God might be nudging you, pushing you, surprising you, moving you. With tongues of flame and hope rekindled. God lit the fire over the heads and in the hearts of the disciples that they did. Come to us this day, this Pentecost day. Arrive in holy flame. Come, come Holy Spirit, come. Fire is a lot like wind, right? It can be both useful and dangerous. It can be useful in candles, in the absence of electricity, or when you're in a meditative, or contemplative, or quiet, or maybe even romantic mood. It can be useful if you're cooking over an open flame, if you're camping, or if you're at a bonfire, or if you're at one of our summer campfire events, which we are still doing this year, instant plug. It can be helpful for warmth. When I was in college, one spring break, we took a trip up to the Lacoudere Reservation in northern Wisconsin um, to help out with some of the things going on in the reservation. It's like a spring mission trip sort of a thing. And it was mid-March in northern Wisconsin. It was still cold. There was still snow and ice all over the ground. And the place where we stayed was at this little camp I don't even remember the name of the camp. But the girls were all in one cabin, and the only heat in the cabin was a wood stove. So we each had to take turns getting up every few hours, one of the nights, to make sure that that wood was still burning, that that fire was still heating our space. Guess who's not very good at keeping fire going? <laughs> My night was a cold night. <laughs> but, Fire can also be dangerous. Fire consumes homes, it consumes businesses, it consumes communities, it consumes millions of acres burned by wildfire every year. The current fires that are burning in Canada, right? Not only are they dangerous for those in their path, but the poor and potentially dangerous air quality that is affecting us here that is affecting all the northern parts of the United States are a part of that too. Did you know that there's even a bird in Australia? It's called the black kite bird that will pick up a burning stick from one fire, carry it in its talons to a safe space and drop it in the dry grass to start another fire so that it can prey on the creatures escaping from the fire it just started. They have figured out that these birds contributed to some of the horrific wildfires, or they call them bushfires, in Australia. And yet even in the aftermath of that danger and destruction comes new life, right? Plant life that is renewed and regenerated following forest fires. New life, new vision, new hope, new opportunities, new challenges, new faith. These are the things wrought by the flames of the Holy Spirit amongst the disciples that first Pentecost morning. 
they saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. More than a thousand years later, a similar experience would strike a particular English clergyman by the name of John Wesley. From his own journals, he wrote, In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That burning flame of the Holy Spirit that lit upon each of the disciples that morning has been burning throughout the ages, igniting people's faith, warming their souls, and illuminating the work that God has for them to do in this world. It's not always a flame that burns brightly. Sometimes the people, the circumstances, the environment around us try to douse that flame, to hide it under a bushel. Right? to keep us from sharing and even keep us from experiencing the joy and the life-giving nature of our faith. But the flame of the Holy Spirit is a persistent flame. It is a flame that may flicker, but will never truly go out. There is a fabulous song by the band Third Day, which is a contemporary Christian band, called Soul on Fire. And these are some of the lyrics for that song. God, I'm running for your heart. I'm running for your heart till I am a soul on fire. Lord, I'm longing for your ways. I'm waiting for the day when I am a soul on fire till I am a soul on fire. So as you listen to the sound of the flames, think about what part of your life needs light and warmth and the spark of God's Holy Spirit this morning. spacious grace and depth untold. God who is present each time we gather together. Come to us this day, this Pentecost day. Arrive in conversation and connection, companionship and sacred sharing. Come, Holy Spirit, come. that I am an introvert, friends, and I know I'm not the only one in this room, but let me clarify something this morning, just for the record, just for the record. An introvert is not someone who hates being around people, okay, or someone who is excessively shy. An introvert is someone who tends to focus inward instead of outward and who gets their energy from time on their own. So by extension, an extrovert is someone who tends to focus outward instead of inward and gets their energy from being with other people. What rejuvenates you? Being on your own or being around others? That's the essential question. So with that working definition, the crowd aspect of Pent the Pentecost story is admittedly a little intimidating for me. Crowds are not always my favorite places to be. If I am at a conference or a meeting or anything like that, a retreat or anything, I need my own room. So that when I get done with being around people at the end of the day, I can kind of shut down a little bit. I don't have to people all day long. And yet, I will also admit that some of my most formative faith experiences throughout my life have been in the midst of crowds. My call to ministry happened 
in the midst of a crowd of hundreds of college students. The confirmation of my choosing Dubuque as my seminary happened in the midst of a crowd of others who were exploring their calls as well. Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew says, I assure you that if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, then my Father who is in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there with them. Granted, this initial Pentecost crowd was decidedly bigger than two or three. We have all of the remaining disciples. We have the crowd big enough to contain people from a wide array of places, all of those places that Gail so well read this morning. And amidst that crowd, amidst the multiple languages being spoken, and all the crowd noise, and all the muttering about drunkenness and new wine, and whatever else may have been going on around them, in that moment, God spoke. The good news of the gospel rang out in the ears and minds and hearts of each and every one of them in their own language. Not because of any effort on the part of the disciples, no duolingo, no babble for these folks, but because God knew the word about Jesus and grace and salvation needed to spread. It needed to get out into the world. So as you listen to the sound of the crowd this morning, think about where and how God might be calling you to speak. And finally, we return to the wind. Rushing wind and holy fire. With visions, birth, and dreams restored. Blow through our lives, Holy Spirit. Light your fire within our hearts. Bless our time with one another and with you. We have arrived on this day, this Pentecost day. Come, Holy Spirit, come. question is a little bit of an odd one. I don't know if it's one we normally think about, but going along with this idea of the sounds of that Pentecost morning and what they mean for our faith, what does your faith sound like? We're going to do a little bit something different that has come up in multiple discussions. We're going to fruit basket upset this morning. So normally I give you the chance to sit. You can still sit contemplatively if you would like to do that. If you are having an introvert morning, you are free to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to invite you to move this morning. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> I'm not the one that asked for this. I know. You all did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think. 
triune God, God of community and God of grace, we lift up our nation to you this day. Help us to not forget the history and the cost that brought us to this time and place. We acknowledge and confess the sins of our shared past, the peoples and nations oppressed and enslaved, the resources and lands that have been stolen, the cultures and freedoms that have been trampled. We acknowledge, Holy One, that our own freedom should never come at the expense of another's. We acknowledge and lift up the sacrifices of so many who have made this nation and our world what it is today, those who have sacrificed, those who spoke up for truth and justice even when their voices shook, those who continue to march and to cry out and to draw our attention to places where freedom is still absent and basic human rights are still ignored. God of Pentecost and good news, God that knows no boundaries, as we celebrate this day, remind us that what makes us great, what makes us beautiful and strong as your people is all the many and varied who have come to this land from around the globe, all the many and varied traditions that have made us who we are today. Help us to honor and celebrate with our neighbors, families, and friends, even and especially when they don't look like us, pray like us, speak like us, or believe like us. We lift ourselves up to you this day, God of grace and truth, God of mercy and hope, because we believe. We believe that you are greater than even our greatest hopes and dreams. We believe that you are stronger than even the strongest among us. We believe that your faithful love knows no bounds. Your steadfast love endures forever, and that only in you do we find our salvation and truest hope. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is number 289 on Pentecost Day. Thank you. 
before we pray for our offering this morning, there is an insert. It's one of those shiny, glossy ones that the denomination sends us, uh, as well as an envelope in your bulletin. Um, the Pentecost offering is one of the special offerings that we take every year. You'll see on the inside of the insert how this offering is used. 40% of it stays with our congregation um, for to support ministries with children, youth, and young adults. 25% goes to the Young Adult Volunteers Program, which is a mission helper program, sort of like the Presbyterian version of um, AmeriCorps. Uh, they serve in, there are uh, YAV, they call them YAV, there are YAV sites around the country, but there are also YAV sites around the world where uh, students go and spend a year living and serving and working uh, in a particular context. So 25% of it goes to that. 25% goes to uh, denominational youth ministries, including Youth Triennium, which is an every three year gathering of Presbyterian youth from around the country, which is coming up next year, I think. Um, and then 10% is devoted to helping at-risk children through other uh, education and sheltering uh, efforts that the denomination does. So the uh, insert is there that tells you a little bit more about that as well as the envelope if you want to contribute to that offering. So for all of the ways that our offering comes to us, all of the wonderful and varied ways that we get to use it, let us pray, pray to bless that offering this morning. Holy One, in our worship, in our witness, in our praise, and in our prayer, we give freely from the blessed abundance that you have given us. Use this offering that we bring today and use it in the work of your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Um, out on the table, I don't know if you saw it on the way in, but out on the table is our new Beloved's Tree sign. It is here. It is ready. Um, we need to decide where the tree is going to go so that I can talk to sergeants and have them figure out how, when they're going to come and plant it. But if you want to go take a look at that sign, uh, that's out there. Um, yes. probably put the tree in the ground. Thank that you. a good spot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In the ground. Just done. Not in the middle of the sanctuary. Duly noted. <laughs> Somewhere out there. That's where it's going to go. Um, and we would get a cool skylight. Um, that we will have some more of our renewal discussion after worship today, and then we will take a break next week because I know it's Memorial Day weekend and people are busy with things. So, yes, today, and then take next week off, and we will resume again on June 3rd. Um, the spouse grief group meets tomorrow, second, thank you, June second, sorry. Um, the spouse grief group meets tomorrow night, or evening at 5.30. Um, I'm going to be working on uh, the June newsletter this week, so if you know of anything that needs to go in the June newsletter, let me know. Either uh, leave a note on my desk or send me an email. Um, do not tell me after worship and expect it to stick in my brain. Write it down for me, <laughs> electronically or otherwise. Um, and also, um, I did put together the instructions for making bulletins for when I am on sabbatical. They are on the desk in the office. Um, they would probably benefit from somebody going through those instructions to make sure that they are clear and make sense. Uh, the sign-up sheet is on the bulletin board. We're kind of hoping that people will sign up week by week. I did send an email out to all of the people who are filling in for pulpit supply saying please have the bulletin information here the Thursday before you will be preaching. So that's when it will be here. If you can help print and fold the bulletins, that would be awesome. Um, and if you could you know, use an editing eye on my instructions, that would also be really helpful. Um, I think that's all that I have. Are there any other announcements this morning? All right, then I'll invite you to rise in body or spirit this morning. Friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we go from this place this morning, let us claim our faith identity on this Pentecost Sunday as the church together. We are the church. 
God's beloved children today, tomorrow, and always, here in this worship through prayer, word, and fellowship. God has embraced us yet again, and our spirits have been made new. Suffused with God's grace, we claim new strength, new purpose, and new hope in our call. With spirits reaffirmed and renewed, we are called to share God's word. We are called to show God's love. We are called to serve God's world. We are called to strive for God's peace. We are the church because God binds us together in sacred companionship and blessed connectedness. And now as the church, God calls us out to do and be God's extravagant love in the world. This service has ended. Now our service can begin. Amen. <laughs>